Okay, so the next, uh, this and the next uh, four questions, five questions total should be on the relatively easy side. So let me just uh, try to do them all in one shot. Let me start with the question one, and then I'll be doing question two, eight, um, uh, ten, and then eleven. <laughs> I don't have enough fingers for eleven. Um, yeah, one, two, eight, ten, and eleven. So this is question one. It says find the atomic numbers, mass numbers, and neutron numbers for the following isotopes. Give your answer as tuple. I see. Yeah, for helium four, this would be you know atomic numbers two. Mass number is 4, it's written right into the name. And the neutron number would be the mass number minus the number of atomic number, which is the number of protons. So, in order to answer this question, I need a periodic table. And, oh, I guess I gave you a link here. Let me use a different periodic table from NIST. Um, so, <laughs> I like the NIST periodic table better because it's, uh, you know, more official source than a random website. Uh, I might change that link to NIST, maybe. I don't know. Um, I'll just let that be. As long as the link is live. Yeah, it's still live. All right. It's fine. So, okay. Copper, 56. I know CU is copper. I don't know the atomic number of copper. So I have to go find the copper. Okay, there it is. 29. Once I know that, then I have everything else I need for the rest of the answer. So um, mass number is 58. That's just um, written right in the name. And the number of neutrons is the mass number minus the atomic number. That's going to be 29. And uh, there's a pattern that you might notice with uh, isotopes with a low atomic number. You will generally find that for stable isotopes, that the number of uh, neutrons and the number of protons are going to be quite similar. Not always the same, but often the same. That's what you're seeing here. With the sodium, that's what Na is, <laughs> but I don't remember the atomic number of sodium, so I gotta go look it up. Okay, it's 11. So the sodium has 11 protons, mass number of 24. Ah, here the uh, number of neutrons isn't 12, it's uh, uh, it's 13. So, you know, it doesn't always have to be the same. It's somewhere close, but not the same. PO, that's a polonium. It's a pretty heavy isotope. So one thing I'm going to expect right from the beginning is that your atomic number will be a lot smaller than just half of this. So let me go find the polonium. That is, um, ah, there it is, 84. Yeah, that's pretty low. Yeah, so 84 protons. Uh, 210 nucleons, protons plus neutrons, so the number of neutrons should be 126 neutrons. Yeah, I'm just doing the calculation in my head, quicker than using calculator. See, I think that's calcium, so let me go find the calcium here. Uh, where's calcium? It's a kind of metal, yeah, there it is. Atomic number 20, uh, is that unstable? Maybe that's unstable. 45 um, for the mass number and then number of proton neutrons is mass number minus number of protons finally pb that's lead um, lead 206 that could be stable it's probably stable i'm not sure <laughs> lead does have stable isotopes in fact it might be the last element that does have stable isotopes i don't know if a bismuth has stable isotopes so Lead 206, uh, it's got 82 protons, 206 nucleons, and uh, 124 neutrons. Yeah, that's probably right. Let me submit it. I don't know what the hint was. Yeah, just read the text. <laughs> These are easy questions, as I was saying. All right, next question, question two. So it says, atomic nucleus is very dense. All right, I think I might have to write some stuff down. So let me absorb that. Being packed with the protons and neutrons, it's representing about this much, packed into that radius, yeah. Performed below estimates to gain some sense of scale for nuclear matter. Okay, find the length of a side of a cube having a mass one kilogram and the density of nuclear matter. <laughs> All right, um, 
So I guess I need to first figure out the density of nuclear matter. I could read in the section and that'll probably tell us something about the density of nuclear matter. But let me see if I can just uh, calculate things from um, the basic, uh, the first principles. So density, as you've seen it defined in physics 4a, is mass per volume. And I can see in the uh, calculation here that I'm going to need to know the density of nuclear matter. So let's calculate that. So density of nuclear matter. I've been given some amount of mass of the nucleon. 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilogram divided by uh, radius of this. Okay, so I need a formula for volume of a sphere, that's a 4 thirds pi times the radius, 10 to minus 15 meter cubed. Okay, let's just work that out in a calculator so that I have the number handy. Okay, 1.67 10 to the times 10 to the power of minus 27 divided by 4 divided by 3 times pi times um, I don't I didn't need a parenthesis. 1 times 10 to the power of minus 15 raised to third power. I'm keeping everything in basic SI units so that when I hit equal, that's in basic SI units. Can I get it to give it to me in scientific notation? Uh, okay. Um, 3.99 times 10 to the 17. Yeah, that's pretty high. So. 3.99 times 10 to the 17 kilogram per cubic meter. All right, that's the density of nuclear matter. So for what question part A is asking, uh, we want uh, we want the length of a side of a cube. Okay, so I think of what we need is we want this solved for volume. So let's do that first. Solving this for volume, we get volume is equal to mass divided by density. And it's asking for the side of the length of the side of the cube. And from knowing the formula for the volume of a cube, I get the sense that if I raise this to power of one third or a cube root, that will give me the length that they're asking for. So let's do that. I'm going to calculate in my calculator. Um, so I have one kilogram divided by the density we calculated, 3.99 times 10 to the power of 17 kilogram per cubic meter. That will cancel out kilograms and I get something in the unit of volume, cubic meter. So let me raise to a power of one third. That's equal to uh, that 1.36 microns. Yeah, that is pretty small. So, yeah, it's already in unit microns. 1.36. Yeah, it's not quite atomic scale, but, you know, imagine having one kilogram. That's a good macroscopic amount of mass into a microscopic size. That's, that's what the length of scale is. A neutron star is an astronomical object made up of neutrons having a density of nuclear matter. Yeah, this density if a neutron star had one solar mass, okay, we are given that estimate. I think I remember this. It's going to be something like 10 kilometers, but let's double check with the calculation. So we have uh, amount of solar mass. I'll, I'll just type. I don't think I need to. Uh, so 2 times 10 to the power of 30 um, divided by the nuclear density. Um, 3.99 times the 10 to the power of um, yeah 10 to the power of um, 17 kilogram per cubic meter so that will give me volume in the unit of cubic meter now I'm just realizing uh, I needed to do a little bit of additional work I can't just take a cube root like we did before because star has a you know spherical shape. So for the correctness, I should really work it out with that in mind. So the so the volume of 
neutron star would have volume of sphere, uh, which is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So uh, we are being asked for the radius of the star. Then um, I need to take the cube root of this quantity here. 3 divided by 4 pi times the volume that we calculated. So let's uh, do that calculation uh, with the number that we have here. We'll calculate um, times 3 divided by 4 divided by pi and all of that raise it to power of 1 third. It's equal to 1 point, so that's a, uh, about 10 to the 4 meters. So if I'm converting that to kilometer, I'm dividing this by a thousand. And I get, uh, let me just give me a regular number, 10.6. Yeah, I was pretty close. Not 10 kilometers, but 10.6 kilometers. So, um, it's, so it, I think this is basically the size of uh, something on the order of the size of the smallest uh, uh, black hole that can form. Because a solar mass is actually too small for a black hole. You need like 1.5 solar mass or double the solar mass, something like that. And um, yeah, that'll fit into a size of uh, something that's, you know, 10 kilometer in radius, like, you know, size of a small city. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's uh, question two. Uh, let's, uh, let's look at question, uh, question eight. All right, so shifting topics. We are looking at question eight. Uh, it's asking if for some thickness piece of lead can absorb some fraction of gamma rays. How many centimeters needed to absorb all but so you know basically reduce the the exposure by a factor of a thousand. Okay. Um, now, if you know how the kind of shielding works, then the first place you would start out with is um, the kind of the idea of the plot, like the so I guess. You can talk about intensity that gets through as a function of uh, thickness d. And what that will end up looking like, it will look like some kind of an exponential decay. Oh, so I guess I should have actually used letter x here. So this is exponential decay. It's proportional to exponential of some distance, minus x, over some characteristic length. Call it lambda or call it D. Um, so that's what it's uh, going to be. And usually this D, that's determined by a number of factors, you know. What material do you have? What kind of radiation is it? What energy is it? Um, and here, I guess the important thing is when the question tells you that some amount will absorb some percentage, they actually gave you the information that's necessary to calculate this, this D. And as long as you're not changing any of the details, you know, you're keeping the same lead and you're keeping the same kind of gamma rays from the same source, then great, this D remains constant. So the information that's being given here can be used to ca calculate D. And once you know D, then you can set up the equation for this. And now, if you're not familiar with all this, I'm pretty sure in hint that's what I, yeah spell out like that's uh, the way you can do this calculation so let me do that uh, let me just uh, keep things simple and just go walk through the calculation where i'm actually solving for d first and then uh, use that to work it out so the information that's been given in the question can be written this way um, so we are being given x 1.3 centimeter so um so all absorb 83% of gamma rays. So what it's saying is the amount of intensity transmitted divided by the incident intensity is equal to not 83%, but that's what's being absorbed. But So what's being transmitted is 0 0.17 or 17%. So that should be equal to exponential of minus x. Uh, let me call that x1 divide by d. 
So I can solve this equation for D. What I need to do is put this whole thing through logarithm, natural log. Having taken the natural log, let's uh, uh, write down what it looks like. So on the left-hand side, I get natural log of 0 0.17 is equal to, on the right-hand side, natural log cancels out the exponent. So I have minus x1 over D. So I'm solving for D here. So I guess I can move D over there, move natural log over there. Doing that gets me D is equal to minus x1 over natural log of 0 0.17. Yeah, I think when I was trying to do this in my head, I was making some mistake. So yeah, that is the correct answer. So um, I guess it's uh, easy to kind of work out the numerically first. So let's do that. So uh, doing this calculation on a calculator, I get um, D is... it. Um, yeah, and I think I need to keep this minus sign because this natural log is going to be negative. So I need that minus sign to kind of cancel out stuff. So 1.3 centimeters minus divided by uh, 0 0.17 natural log. That's equal to 0 0.7337. So my D is 0 0.7337. Uh, let me say uh, six five. I'm keeping extra significant figures because this is an intermediate calculation. And every time you have a number, you should be asking the question in what unit. Here, the d takes on the unit of x one, so this is going to be in centimeters, uh, which is good. I think uh, uh, when I answer here, it's gonna be in centimeters. So centimeters gonna be my unit for this whole question. So. Given this, let's now modify the equation we set up for what they are asking us. They are asking for a setup which will absorb all but 0.1%. So that's going to modify what this will be. Um, this will now, instead of being 0 0.17, it will be 0 0.001, a thousandth of initial instant intensity. So... Uh, with this being 0 0.0001, oops, uh, too many zeros, 0, 0, 001. Uh, this time, I'm not solving for D, I'm solving for X1 now. Or, I guess, not X1, but X2. So, let's do that. X2 is equal to, uh, I guess I'm multiplying through by minus D. So, minus D times natural log of 0 0.001. So, let me do that calculation in a calculator. Um, so this, this is my D, so let me, um, let me take the negative of that, multiply that with um, natural log of 0 0.001, natural log is equal to, hopefully I get a positive number, good, 5.07. Hey, that's not as big as I thought it would have to be. 5.07. And I guess what's helping you here is that um, it's a, you know, exponential aspect of it. So when you, um, you know, like this times a four, it's not blocking it four times as much. It's, a, you know, like a four in the exponent. It's a, like raised to power four. So before it was blocking, you know, 10% or 20%, um, that raised to power of four, you know, 0.17 raised to power of four is, um, a lot, uh, it's not, you know, divide, it's a lot smaller than divide by four. So, all right, yeah, that's the shielding needed. Okay, uh, next question, I did a question nine already, so question 10. Okay, so question 10 asks that a particle has a mass equal to 21 U, that's a, like unified atomic mass unit. If this mass is com converted completely into energy, how much energy is released? Oh, let me show you a shortcut that makes this super easy. I'm going to use Wolfram Alpha. So using Wolfram Alpha, this is how you would do it. You don't even have to do any calculation. Let me just type in 21U as if I'm searching for it. I think Wolfram Alpha is going to realize I'm asking uh, you as a yeah, unified atomic mass unit. It's uh, interpreting it correctly as me telling it that that's the mass. It's giving me a bunch of information about this mass, one of which will be its mass in the unit of electron volt per C squared. 
drop the C squared, that's why I rest energy. So it's going to be 19.56 giga electron volt or in the unit of mega electron volt, 19,000 um, and 561 mega electron volt. That's it. Doesn't even involve calculation. It's just looking up things in the correct unit. I mean, you can do that, you know. Wolfram Alpha is just a very intelligent calculator. If you can use it in a way that um, reduces the busy work for you, great. Use it. I have no objection. Okay, last question, question 11. Um, find the mass defect, binding energy, and binding energy per nucleon for the helium-3 nucleus. Um, what is it talking about? Now, I guess the easiest thing to do is uh, look up the mass defect in your textbook. And when you look it up, this is what it'll tell you. So m what mass defect is, is the basically the difference between the amount of mass you would have expected for helium-3 and compare that with the actual mass of helium-3. So I think Wolfram Alpha has helium-3 uh, mass. So you have mass of helium-3, that's what you would have expected. Now let's uh, compare that with the um, mass that you would have expected for helium-3. So the amount of mass that you would have expected for helium-3 is, well, you know, uh, it's constituent particles. Helium-3 has two protons, so two times proton mass plus it has one neutron, one times neutron mass. And uh, it, for this calculation, the small difference between neutron and proton mass matters, so you have to use separately. So adding all this, it should have been in the unified atomic mass unit, 3.022178U. You can see that that's not the same number as that. And that's the mass defect. And um, one thing I'm not sure is which way the difference is taken. Let me do it this way. Let me do it this one minus that one. And if the thing says my answer is incorrect, I will flip it around. <laughs> so that one minus this one. And uh, it's going to do the calculation. Give me the answer in the mass unit. And um, now your question is asking for answer in mega electron volt per C squared. So I look for that. Mega, oh, it's not giving it to me in that unit. So I'll say in and maybe per C squared. It's a, yeah, 6.696 and maybe per C squared. And if it tells me that that answer is wrong, then, um, then I will, um, you know, turn it into a negative version of that answer. Uh, okay, negative version of the answer. I, I don't know. I, you know, this is the not the kind of thing that um. Oh, I know what what am I? What's the problem here? So the problem here is the um. It's the electron mass. And these numbers are small enough that electron mass now begins to matter. So I need to figure out. So when they when it gives me the helium three mass, it's actually giving me the uh, mass of the neutral helium three, meaning this includes two mass of two electrons. So I need to include mass of two electrons here. So plus two times electron mass. So with that, I yeah, mass effects is larger because yeah, um, yeah. So let me try seven point seven one eight, and let's hope that's correct. Good. <laughs> um, yeah. So the mass effect is that uh, difference between the actual mass you measure for the particular isotope and the uh, amount of mass you would have expected given all the particles that make up that isotope, including the thing that makes the isotope neutral. <laughs> so, so that's the um, mass defect. And the mass defect basically gives you the binding energy. Uh, you account for that, that difference in the energy. Oh yeah, that must be the binding energy.
And once you have the binding energy, just divide it by the nucleon. I have three nucleons here, so that divided by three is 2.5. Um, Can I do this in my hand? Uh, seven, um, two, six, repeating, I think so, seven. If I get on the wrong answer, I'll just do this in calculator. Good. <laughs> So yeah, that's the binding energy per nucleon. So you can kind of guess. I guess uh, if you are guessing the way I was doing, the thing that could have tripped someone is um, remembering to include the electron mass. I remember that confusing me for a while until I figured out that at certain uh, energy scales, the electron mass matters because it's a half an MeV. So if the amount of energy difference you are talking about is only on the order of MeV, then yeah, half an MeV matters. So that's a question 11. Oh, I think that's the last of our five questions in this set. So, um, so that covers all the questions in problem set 14. Uh, let me know of any questions. Um, thank you.